Hello and welcome to Sportcast, a Canadian podcast discussing patient-oriented research. Research done in partnership with patients. I'm Beverly Pomeroy. And I'm Lisa Ridgway. And we are patient partners who sit on a variety of patient councils and advisory groups, all with the vision to encourage research to answer research questions that matter to patients and aim to improve healthcare. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you will be inspired to get involved and create your own impact in order to support healthcare research be more relevant and meaningful. Please enjoy the show. In a new home and brought to you from home. Well, Sporecast here we is are back. at another episode of Sporecast. And we have a mighty star for us today. How are you today, Bev? I am doing well, and yeah, I'm like kind of cross between nervous and excited to have this guest on today. Yes, normally our guests tell us that they're very nervous, but today I'm a little nervous, <laughs> I must say. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge, because Bev and I are calling in uh, from BC and our guest is from Montreal, I want to acknowledge and share the privilege that we have because we're calling in from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of Indigenous peoples across BC. And, BC is home to almost 200 distinct uh, nations and the Métis chartered um, communities, and each of them have their own unique traditions and uh, history. So um, our guest today is a demonstration of uh, living proof of the, the power of one. Um, I met Andre Picard at uh, Casper, the virtual conference that was held in May, as much as you can meet uh, anyone at a virtual conference. And of course, uh, Andre Picard is the health reporter and columnist for the Globe and Mail. And you've been a staff member for um, 33 years, which is longer than I've known my husband. And I've been married a long time. So <laughs> you are also the author of five best selling books. You're an eight time nominee for newspaper awards. I think I'll just cut it off there because um, we really need to hear from you and not me. So. Let's not let this interview go to waste. Uh, thank you, Andre, for joining us. Thank you. I've been following you on Twitter for a long time, and obviously you're quite you know, renowned here in Canada around healthcare conversations. And you know, our, our podcast is all on patient-oriented research, and in particular, this series is on the COVID side of things. And, and one of the things that I, I think I saw in, in one of the articles that you talk about is that health and science reporting isn't just about doctors, drugs, and test tubes, uh, but it really is about choices, biases, and assumptions. And one of the things that you mentioned is not uh, necessarily, you know, to the benefit of citizens equitably. So I'm just wondering, you know, healthcare and healthcare research across Canada, we had to react really hard and fast to COVID uh, along the way. And the, the sense is, and we see it on Twitter and we see it in our own communities, is that patient engagement and partnerships sort of fell to the fell to the wayside. So, you know, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And, and can we rebuild trust in this world of patient oriented and patient engagement? You know, because we, we felt we made good progress, but I'm not so sure. Yeah, so we've been talking about this for the last few years, you know, patient centered care and patient directed research and all lots of good words. But when something comes along, when a crisis comes along, it tests our, our values, right? And I think this has really tested our values. And I, I think you're right, patients have kind of been tossed aside for this. We're all busy with the science. Are we going to get a vaccine? I think we've lost sight quite a bit of the fact that who's going to get the vaccine? It's going to be people uh, who needs the treatment. It's people. And and I think the, the research that's really lacking is on the collateral damage. You know, mm. there's so much attention being paid uh, in research and elsewhere to this new novel coronavirus that we've kind of forgotten all the other stuff and we can't stop doing research on how do we access care and how do we make cancer care better and what are the you know how important are the social determinants of health and they've become they're really at the forefront of this epidemic because when bad things happen they happen much worse to people who are already marginalized and this bug has demonstrated this in a, a really magnified manner. And do, you, and do you think we can rebuild that trust, Andre? Like, do you think, you know, we can regain that progress that we've made? Or do you think we have to kind of start back at scratch and, you know, sort of look at it again? Because obviously, it, we weren't doing it the best way we could, right? 
Yeah, I don't think it has to start from scratch. I think lots of work has been done over the years. I think uh, the big difference this time is there's a recognition that uh, we're failing patients and that in itself is going to uh, make people smarten up, I think, a lot more quickly. So I think we're already seeing some movement. There's a, you know, really troubling aspect of the uh, pandemic is people being shut out from their loved ones in long-term mm -hmm. care. That's a real patient centeredness, family centeredness issue that's really getting lots of attention. And I think it's reminding us that that voice is so, so essential that we can't afford to, to ignore it. So I, I don't think you're going to have to start from scratch, but I think there's going to be some uh, harsh reminders that are going to have to be delivered to, to people in power. But things have changed even since May when you and I met at the Casper conference. So you know, as part of the pandemic response, our, our healthcare um, institutions and organizations, we just sort of teleported ourselves, like some Star Trek thing, into the virtual world. And, and it happened fast. All of a sudden, everybody's online. So, you know, how did this happen so quickly? And, and what, what red flags are raised for, for you, uh, as a journalist, particularly, um, around this urgent transition to technology? Well, I think there's some good and there's some bad in it. The good is that we're finally doing stuff we should have done a decade ago, which is have virtual visits with our physicians, follow up. You know, people don't have to drive three hours to see a doctor for five minutes to get a prescription renewed. This is all ridiculous stuff that's been going on for a long time for no reason. So that's good. Uh, now, what's essential is that we keep doing it when things go back to, to normal. And I use that term cautiously because I think the new normal is going to be very different. But I think mm -hmm. so. That's the good part. The good part is we're using this technology the way we should have a long time ago. We have to adjust the payment schedules, et cetera, so that doctors keep doing it. Now, the bad part of it is that uh, inequities arise. So there are people who don't, in a lot of Canada, you know, we, we're both in big cities. We take for mm -hmm. granted that we have the internet and we can talk on Zoom. A lot of Canada, probably the vast majority of our geography, doesn't have access to high-speed internet, let alone reliable internet. So they're becoming more marginalized. So we have to figure out, you know, one of the priorities if we're finally embracing virtual care is going to have to be, we have to have equal or equitable access to, to data across the country, our whole big country. <clears throat> so that's important. The other part is, uh, you know, it's great if you're a researcher and you have a lovely home and you have your home office and you can do your Zooms all day. It's very different if you are sick and you live in a one-room apartment with three other people and you share the phone and the internet. Again, people get cast aside for being poor and we can't, can't allow that. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that came out for me in listening to uh, your podcast with Jane Philpot and Brian Goldman, we can't let a good crisis go to waste. Like these are opportunities where we're shining some light down those cracks in our social fabric. So, you know, I think we are stronger together, but ultimately together it has a big meaning. There's a lot of people out there that aren't at this table right now. Yeah, and we have to make sure, um, as you said, the pandemic has shone the light on a lot of failings. We have to make sure we address them, uh, not just the low-hanging fruit, not just the stuff that suits the the, the elite, the people who are going to come out of this smelling like roses. We have to make sure that we tackle the stuff that's uncomfortable and difficult, probably before anything else. Yeah, I think that's going to be really key because I love you, you quite often say more care faster and, and better and technology definitely is, you know, helping with that. But I do agree. I think there's a lot of people that aren't at the table, my own sort of queer community, you know, a lot of them are missing. And, you know, I, I, where I am here in Vancouver in the Lower Mainland in Fraser Health Authority, we have the largest uh, diverse community in the entire province. And so we definitely see that because a lot of the patient partners would go to, you know, a center and use their Wi-Fi or the library and use their devices. And it's just not happening. So we definitely uh, are missing that voice. And I guess then that kind of brings me to ask, you know, one of the questions that we talk about or we think, uh, is that patient partnering and patient engagement really is a powerful, powerful, um, you know, tool or weapon to help fight COVID-19. And you talk a lot about public policy and that it matters. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Where are family voices and leadership representation sort of in the public policy if it does matter? And is that a powerful enough tool 
uh, you know, to help fight COVID and sort of reshape our healthcare community. I think we have a lot of work to do to, to reshape the health system and it has to be, I think, ultimately led by the family voice, the, the patient voice, because for too long we've been telling people, here's what you're getting rather than asking them what do they need. So I think mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to do that a little bit and there is progress being made, but I, I say, we said at the outset, I think we're losing some of that with COVID. It's back to, uh, we're gonna tell you what's best for you in yeah. this, uh, you know, we're gonna lock you up in your care home, that's what's best for you. And you know, where's the patient voice there? Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke, I can't tell you how many hundreds of families and uh, elderly people who call me and email oh. me, you know, feeling like they're in prison. And we're, oh. why are we not listening to that voice? There, there are trade-offs in every public policy and we don't have the balance right in that one and in, in many of the COVID related policies. It's been yeah, very, yeah. very top down. Uh, the, the guidance, you know, well-intentioned, but well-intentioned isn't good enough. No, it yeah. is not. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's not just a question of health literacy. It's just, it's back to that issue of um, trust. You know, we're buying into the system. We're flattening the curve. We're wearing our masks. We're doing the things that help public policy, but without the corollary of the, the trust and being involved in the decision making. So, yeah, I think patient partners and, and patient engagement that people like Bev and I across Canada are feeling really, really marginalized. Now, that's not to say that we're pessimistic. I mean, there, there are good things that can come out of this. And in your podcast, you talked about a whole bunch of them. Like you talked about uh, low wages don't necessarily mean, you know, low skill. And we've already highlighted the importance of, of family caregivers. So, you know, what, what gives you, um, what gives you hope? If I could ask you personally or professionally as a, as a journalist, what gives you hope going into uh, the fall and winter is coming. I think what's giving me hope in this is we've highlighted a lot of things we've known for a long time and we've really been able to shine a, a light on them in a way that we weren't without the pandemic, you know, so things like uh, personal support workers getting paid really criminally low wages. So that's being addressed to a certain extent. Uh, we're not going to go back there. You know, we're going to have more workers. Uh, I think the whole uh, issue of how do we treat our elders in society is one that's really fundamental that we're not going to be able to run away from no matter how this pandemic turns out. I think we, we've been reminded with the number of deaths of our, our elders, just how badly we treat them. So I think there's really fundamental stuff we're going to address. Uh, I often say, and people are surprised by this, but I think the most important health measure that's been taken during this whole pandemic is actually giving people the CERB, giving them a basic income, right? It's reminded yes. us that the one thing you need more than anything else to be healthy is an income. Yes. So I think we're going to really make big steps towards the, the, the idea of a guaranteed annual income. So these are, these are big, big societal policy issues that are going to move forward because of this pandemic. Now, that being said, I think we can't uh, be too, uh, looking, too forward looking at this point. Yeah. I think that we're far from the, the pandemic being over. Uh, the fall, we all know we're all looking at the fall with great trepidation. Mm -hmm. uh, when people go back inside, when we have the flu in the mix, uh, when we have this second wave, which we know historically happens with pandemics. So there's a lot of factors coming for September, October that make the fall really scary. So we have to keep addressing these big societal issues and moving them ahead, but at the same time, not, not take our eye off the, the coronavirus ball. Yeah. yeah, that's so that's so true. Like to kind of be in the moment. I mean, even here on the West Coast, we're having a surge right now. So I'm just, you know, being really cautious, even in my own world, what I'm doing and where I'm going and stuff. And, and you know, just sort of a, a final thought here too, Andre, is, you know, Lisa and I are kind of new to the world of media. We're patient partners that decided to, you know, have a podcast on patient-oriented research. I'm just wondering from your experience um, or your thoughts on, you know, how best can media or even new media sort of share COVID and have these conversations? Like, do you have any words of wisdom that you can offer us or maybe other people that are listening? Well, I think what's important is, you know, I work for an old newspaper, The Globe, a traditional <laughs> media. And the, the reality is that traditional media is dying for a whole bunch mm -hmm. of reasons. So we have to find ways of getting information to people, information they need, uh, information that's useful and true. You know, there's a lot of 
nonsense floating around yeah. out there. But I think overall this democratization of the discussion is really, really good. Uh, but we have to make sure again that it's equitable, that not just rich people have access to news because it costs too much money, or yeah. that uh, you know people who don't have an income have to rely on on nonsense that's free and they can be manipulated. So I think it's mm -hmm. really uh, good media is essential to essential to our democracy and to our health and to our well-being. And we have to figure out a way of getting information to people in a way that's affordable and accessible. And uh, that's going to be a big, big challenge in society going forward. But I, I don't think the answer is what we have now. Uh, you know, I think okay. there's benefits of the traditional media that I work on. I, in, I don't want to crap on it too much, uh, but it's in trouble. So we have to figure out alternatives and figure out how people get the news they need and especially the health news they need. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You've donated your time very generously to <laughs> our podcast, though we, we often ask our guests at the end if they'd like to go out for uh, a Timmy's donut, but we can't even do that with you. So all we can give you is our heartfelt thanks for sharing your voice and your, your time from Montreal. Uh, it's very hard to be complacent in this season of of suffering so that's why we wanted to reach out and get your wisdom and, and boy you provided it in uh, bucket load so i just want to say thank you very much uh, andre picard for for joining our sportcast well mm -hmm. thank you and we'll have a virtual timmy's sometime okay that's <laughs> a sounds deal. like a plan thank you thank so much you. andre forecast is now zoomed to you courtesy of hosts and creators bev pomeroy and lisa ridgeway with the able assistance of a small but mighty team of production partners at the BC Support Unit, powered by Communications Lead, Justin Audison, Project Manager, Michelle Duffy, and me, Sporecast's technical producer and occasional announcer, I'm Kent cadigan Lofsgar. If you'd like to get in touch with us and learn more, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Spore underscore cast that's spore s-p-o-r underscore cast c-a-s-t hashtag sporecast we can also be reached via email at sporecast1 at gmail.com or visit our website www.sporecast.ca